In, uh, in today's talk, we're going to cover uh, a few important points. Uh, we're not going to have time to cover the whole expansive problem of oracles and how they're secured, but we're going to cover a few very specific points that, that are quite important. So the first point is, what is a secure oracle? How do we define a secure oracle, um, specifically for blockchains and smart contracts? Then we're going to look at how you can prove the security of individual node operators and the proof of an individual node operator's security gives you assurances that when those individual node operators are combined into a network of Oracle node operators, then you have a greater degree of security by combining them. And then the last thing we're gonna go towards is how do you take an Oracle network beyond uh, data delivery and how do you expand it into more general purpose computational stuff that people can't or don't wanna do on blockchains, but they, they still want to do um, in, in a trust minimized manner. So these are, these are the three topics that we're, we're gonna cover. So I, I think it's quite useful to understand the, 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 the nature of the problem. So the nature of the problem is that um, blockchains and smart contract environments, uh, due to the way they're secured by miners and by the consensus that's derived around the, you know, the blocks of uh, transactions that, that essentially define what a blockchain actually provides, they uh, preclude the possibility of reaching out to external data sources. So this, this possibility is precluded because of the security concerns um, that you would introduce into a minor set, and it's also precluded mostly for c credentialed APIs, because then you would need all the miners to have the relevant access to the relevant data sources. You would need to replicate a huge amount of requests. So there's a number of problems about actually connecting with data, a number of problems with the security concerns you generate uh, by connecting data to, to a minor set, and this is why the, the minor set of all these chains, Ethereum, Hyperledger, all, all the great chains that are coming up, why they're effectively unable to, to meet all the demands of on-chain data delivery. And for security reasons, they'll probably remain unable to do that. Now, this is a very large problem because it essentially puts us in an environment where the only data that contracts can be written about is the data of tokenization. So tokenization data is generated on-chain, it lives on-chain, and it's manipulated on-chain by, by, by various contracts. So this, this is why our space is about tokens. Our space is about tokens because the, the ability to write a contract is right now limited only to token data because that is the data that is accessible to, to these contracts, partly because that's, that's data that's generated on chain. It's a, it's a very natural evolution, right? The system can generate this data. It's, it's useful, valuable data from the point of view of, of generating and moving around these tokens. It is genuinely useful and valuable. As, as everybody can see, it's, it's starting to replace certain, um, certain alternatives in the traditional centralized world already, but it's, it's just one subset of data. And that subset of data has limited our space to being about tokens. Whereas the vast majority of digital agreements out there are not about ownership, they're not about tokenization, they're not about transfer of ownership, they're about events. They're about shipment of good events for, for trade finance or insurance events via IoT data or market events for what's now called DeFi products. And in order for our space to expand beyond, um, beyond tokens, we really need to, to take it to a place where that data that contracts could be written about is uh, accessible, but very importantly, securely accessible, because our space's entire guarantee is that it's a form of digital agreement that's extremely secure. Now, if we're able to solve this problem, I think we can see another step function like we've already seen. So one of the first step functions we saw was us going from Bitcoin to these Swiss Army Knife opcode-based uh, chains, like the ones I worked on uh, you know, back in 14 and 15. Then Ethereum successfully took us from these opcode-based chains where it took six months to a year and took us to a scriptable environment. And the scriptable environments are, are obviously the future and what, you know, the way smart contracts are gonna need to be written. And now uh, we think there's a number of high-quality scriptable environments that could benefit from being able to interact with data in a highly reliable manner. And this highly reliable interaction with data is what we think is gonna propel um, smart contract development outside of scripting tokens and into scripting uh, what's called now decentralized financial products, which are essentially derivatives and, and many pretty basic financial products, um, decentralized insurance, which is basically insurance, uh, all kinds of other, other gaming applications, fraud proof gaming applications. But the, the, the real point is that our space can see an entirely new level of usefulness and can actually be completely redefined if we enable people to build 
applications that are, that are about all these events. So that is essentially the body of work that we're focused on. That's, that's what we do. We generate um, basically a blockchain middleware, um, or you could call it an abstraction layer between blockchains and, um, and all these data resources. And our initial focus has been on data delivery to enable people to build contracts around all these events and, and to do that in a way that uh, maintains security. So the, the thing that, that, that's kind of the thing that we really realized during, during the course of, of, of building these oracles, during the course of building smart contracts for about six years now, is that a smart contract is really defined as all the parts that uh, could make it fail, right? So in a token contract, all the parts that could make it fail are the token registry on chain and the code manipulating the results of that token registry. And, and, and so that's a secure uh, environment for tokens. And so that works and that provides the, the guarantees of a smart contract. What we're really talking about is expanding the feature set to make these events-driven contracts, which is very exciting and extremely um, important in, in, in our opinion. But we need to maintain the security that a contract provides. So what we need to do is we need to expand the surface area, but we need to secure that new surface area in an extremely effective manner, providing uh, the guarantees that uh, a reasonable consumer of that security would want to see. So that's kind of the body of work that, that I'll go into more now that, now that we have some more shared context. Now, the, the way that we create this security is very important and it, and it, and it has a few fundamental uh, pillars to it. The, the first fundamental pillar is decentralization. So just like the security generated for the contract code itself is essentially generated by extreme uh, redundancy, which people call decentralization, right? You have full replicas performing the same computation in a very costly, highly verified manner. Uh, we're, approaching, we're, we're approaching this problem from the same fundamental point of view because that's the fundamental innovation of our space, right? Now, we do this in a, in a very specific manner where um, an oracle, the, the, the oracle is the blockchain middleware, is, is, is what's responsible for delivering data or off-chain computation, forms what we call a binding service agreement. A binding service agreement commits that oracle to deliver data or perform a computation uh, under a very specific set of conditions over a very specific period of time at, at a very specific set of quality, which is then compared against its peers um, in, in the other nodes in the node network and, and validated so that uh, an input can be considered reliable. These binding service agreements generate a lot of data and that data creates something we call provable security, where if you have a lot of proof that an oracle has successfully delivered data, it's committing to deliver data now, it has crypto economic guarantees to deliver the data, and it has a number of other guarantees that I'll go into shortly, you can achieve what we call provable security, which is not security on the basis of brand, or a nice glossy website, or like here are all the logos of who uses us. It's, it's on the basis of uh, data that's on chain, that we know is immutable, that we know has cost money to generate, that we know has some uh, provable reliability and actually has some value for the user. Because the more data that they've generated to prove that they are a reliable source of external data and, and good computation, the more transactions they get. We also practice something called defense in depth. Defense in depth is the layering on of multiple security approaches. Uh, at this point, we're at uh, centralization, trusted execution environments. Now we're implementing our first approach for zero knowledge proofs and then we're in early stages of uh, researching homomorphic encryption. Well, in application to this, not in general. In general, no, 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 <laughs> in application to this. Um, and all of this is built by a large open source community of uh, core developers, uh, engineers that write the actual integration code, which is also open source and can be evaluated, uh, as well as the security research and academic community who we work with very closely and uh, who we're always thrilled to work with. So if you're, you're part of that community and you find this problem interesting, we're, we're very excited to work with you and uh, have a very active dialogue where you tear it apart and uh, we'll, we'll see if it stands up. Um, so generally speaking, I think once again, the useful nuance here is to understand what problem uh, we're, we're trying to solve at a more, in, now in a more detailed level. So the fundamental problem is decentralized, decentralized computation provides these security and reliability guarantees. Data sources are in many cases uh, abundant and often hardened after 30, 40 years of delivering data, plus they have liability. And uh, the middleware component is where things um, fail right now and are, are unfortunately gonna continue to fail unless people adopt a security-driven mindset towards this problem. 
And that, that might be driven by failures or it might be driven by you know, logical assessment of the security of their architecture. Uh, I'm really fine with either, but hopefully it's, it's the one where they assess their architecture and, and look at how to secure their system because the situation you don't want is you have you know, 8,000 wonderful Ethereum nodes or whatever other nodes doing some great computation for you that's very highly costly and, and supposedly secure because it's so costly. Um, and then it all, it all goes to hell because the Oracle in your basement got compromised by whoever, right? So that's, that's, this architecture that I'm showing here is not the security model of our space. The security of a mo model of our space is something closer to this architecture where you have um, any amount of independent node operators that provide you guarantees. And then the question becomes, how do these node operators provide us these guarantees, right? How, how do node operators provide us uh, with assurances that they're gonna uh, reliably deliver data, execute computation? So. If you really think about it, that really becomes the question. And there's two approaches. One approach is the volume model. And what I, what I call the volume model is we're going to have 10,000 node operators, and they're all going to do everything all the time, and that's what we'll do. But uh, unfortunately, for data delivery, that doesn't work so well. You, you don't want 10,000 API calls. You don't want everybody exposed to the same request. You, 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 you have problems with this volume-based model. So you need, you need a new model where you start to define uh, the relationship between a user contract and an oracle in a more rigorous manner. So this is, this is the first thing that we do. And I, I guess th this isn't actually meant to, to, to highlight our system. It's meant to highlight a more, a more nuanced point that, that I think what's needed is very specific commitments between oracles and user contracts. And for those commitments to have long-term long costs and immediate costs. And for all of those interactions to be memorialized in a way that people can rely on those, the, those pieces of data to what we call uh, generate provable security. So the nuance here isn't necessarily how, how our system works. I think the nuance, the, the interesting nuance to think about from an academic point of view is how do we properly define the relationship between one highly reliable system that we're assuming is reliable and to this, these other set of node operators that are gonna do very specific computations initially data delivery and eventually some more advanced computations. So that's the, real, that's, that's, that's the real body of work here. And then how do we take that to its furthest limit, furthest limit to prove security to people? Because what's gonna happen is people are gonna wanna increase beyond three oracles or five oracles or seven oracles as the value that those oracles trigger increases. So the nuance here isn't just giving them the initial three oracles. And, 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 and giving them a good reason to rely on those. It's giving them the ability to scale up an Oracle network as the value secured or triggered by that Oracle network also scales. And likewise, possibly to scale down those costs as the value of that contract that triggers um, decreases. So once, once you achieve decentralization at this middleware level, at this basically abstraction layer between um, any number of blockchains and, and the external uh, data landscape and, and all these off-chain computational resources, which I'll, I'll highlight in a minute, you, um, you start to achieve interesting properties where you can actually also achieve decentralization for data sources. Now, this isn't always possible, but in the case of uh, some of the most commonly used uh, cases, use cases we have now with um, basically price data, you do have a large amount of data sources, and be basically before you decentralize the, the middleware layer, you, you, there isn't a lot of value in decentralizing the data layer, but once you decentralize the middleware layer and you have assurances about that layer, and those assurances are very well proven to you, then you can go on to decentralize the data layer, which is why we have integrations with, with a very large number of data providers because we actually encourage people to not only decentralize the middleware layer, but also the data, data layer. Now, uh, just to get slightly deeper on, on how this works, uh, so we can, we can have the subsequent discussions about how, how a system like this should evolve, or, or how we should reason about these problems, I think it's useful to just look at this in slightly more detail beyond we want to get away uh, from centralization. That level of detail is how do you define the work between an oracle and the user contract? What, what we have for this is something called jobs. Jobs define a distinct piece of work. So this, this distinct piece of work is I want to get the ETHUSD price from CoinMarketCap. And that's all that this job does. And what node operators do is they opt in to fulfill jobs. They opt in to say, I'm willing to run this code, and all of that code is very clearly outlined on, on something called the Chainlink Market, which is made you know, by a great ecosystem company called Linkpool. And this, um, this essential 
definition uh, clarifies for users exactly what the computation will be, and it also allows node operators to opt in into a limited subset of computations that they know they can fulfill and they know they can be secure, and they once again also know the credentials and the responsibilities they have to meet in order to fulfill this job. Right? So we think that the way to solve this problem is to, is to get, get to an extreme level of definition about what an oracle is doing for a user contract. And then for that extreme level of definition to be um, memorialized on chain and to have consequences for the long-term reputation of the oracle as well as the near-term loss of stake. But, but the first step is really how do you clearly define what an oracle is gonna do for a contract in abs with absolutely no uncertainty. Down, down to every step of the computation that it's gonna perform. In this case, it's relatively simple, it's, it's data delivery. Once you've defined that, then you can go on to selecting the node operators you want in your Oracle network. We have, uh, I think we're approaching 70 now re reviewed node operators, and um, I think uh, about a quarter of those have been fully security reviewed, which means they've gone through a rigorous security review process, and, they, and they've, they've had certain amounts of identity uh, attached to them, and they've had certain uh, amounts of infrastructure verified to be secure in, in very specific ways that I'll go into in a minute. But once you've defined the work, then you can select the node operators that are gonna opt in to perform that work for you under very specific crypto economic guarantees. Once that happens, you can arrive at a system where uh, you can say, look, I have a market worth $100,000. I think I only need three oracles. Uh, I know I need three different data feeds because the costs are approximately the same. And that's actually another big goal of ours is to get the economic costs of decentralization extremely low so that people can acquire um, decentralization at, at every layer from, 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 from their contract to whatever resource they need. So you, you can achieve an architecture like this uh, very quickly in our system. Um, it should take you about an hour. There's actually plenty of pre-made networks that, that everything you're seeing here is live. And you, uh, I'm thrilled if, you know, if you're a security researcher or auditor, feel free to use it, knock on it, let us know responsibly. <laughs> if you find something, we take, uh, we take all those things very seriously. Now, I think DeFi is, is very interesting, but I, I think the reality is that if a system like this works, you can achieve um, a lot of other use cases. So this is an example of smart uh, contract crop insurance, where let's say there is geographies that don't have crop insurance, and they want to be insured against lack of rainfall. And, and interestingly enough, all the financial contracts that have been like turned into these crazy financial products that sometimes create more problems than they're worth, they all started out on the basis of giving business owners an ability to mitigate risk. And so I, I think some of the most exciting contracts are actually the simplest, where they're providing, um, they're providing a very real service to people that, for example, don't have a local legal jurisdiction that can give them um, an insurance contract against rainfall when that, when that actually decides if their farm will succeed or if they'll have, their farm will have to close down or they'll have to move to some crazy big city which is a real thing. Uh, so I think the, the, the exciting um, thing here is not only creating DeFi products, it's allowing people to compose whatever contract they think users need and to be able to do that against highly reliable data sources with highly reliable um, node operators that, that provide that data so that if you were to show this to a user and you were to say, I have a, I have a system that's definitely gonna pay you out. If there isn't rain, there's no way I can run away with your money. You're definitely gonna get paid out if you pay me your you know, very small premium. Um, the assurance there needs to come from both the, the core computational layer and the middleware layer and probably even the data layer. And, and as the value of, of, of that contract increases, those guarantees also need to increase. So that means the amount of nodes providing the data needs to increase, the data providers probably need to increase. And I mean, the, the fascinating thing is that this is not, this is not as um, new an idea as some people might think. Like if, if you look at certain, um, certain situations that have existed for decades, like the LIBOR rate, the LIBOR rate triggers $200 trillion in derivatives value. It's, it's generated by a panel of eight to 11 banks. Like there's, at a certain point, the, the technological kind of nuances of reducing risk tend towards decentralization. It's, it's, um, it's, it's actually a very natural uh, inclination, and I think uh, part of our job as a space is to give people a way to do that in, in a way that is more informed, is more guaranteed than, than somebody's brand, um, you know, I use AWS Secure System X and you can trust me, right? 
I think that's really a big part of the project that, that our whole space is engaged in. Now, on the other side of this, you also need uh, outgoing payments. So I, I, I think, I think a, a really working system of these next generation contracts involves both inputs and outputs. So I, 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 just to be clear, it's not just about inputs, it's about inputs and outputs for payments to whatever environment that people want to use. It's, it's once again not, not our job to tell people what data sources to use or what payment systems to use. It's our job to create a decentralized computational layer that allows them to build all of these new types of contracts so that our space goes from being 90% tokens, 10% everything else, to 90% um, event-driven contracts and 10% tokens. And, and that doesn't mean tokens get less. It means the token pie grows and all the events driven, like the pie basically grows by, by, by that order of magnitude. Now, I think that the, the next set of points here are around what happens when people start using all of these chain links that I've shown, both for data and payments. Well, I, I think this is the nuanced point that I'd be thrilled to have feedback about, and I'd be thrilled to engage more with various members of the acad academic community and, and developers and security auditor folks. The assumption here is that we have a system that generates um, ungameable, immutably recorded, highly uh, accurate data about what a node operator did for a contract. And we also have data about that that contract is not run by the node operator. So this collection of data and uh, at its accuracy, at, at this level of accuracy should provide for us an ability to say this node operator has performed a million high quality data delivery computations. Those high quality data delivery computations were on the subject of uh, crypto prices and we know that they have um, a success rate of 99 and you know six nines, and and that's what that, that's what you're buying, not based on some website, but based on a very data-driven approach. So this is this is kind of the newness of our approach: is we're 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 seeking to instantiate a system that has economic um, incentives and guarantees that lead node operators to engage in data delivery and computation in a way that continually generates more data. And that data can then be relied on to choose them, which is part of the incentives. So this is, this is the nuance of our, of, our, of our system that I'd be thrilled, to, you know, if you have an opinion, I'd be thrilled to meet up after uh, we're, we're, we're continually expanding this and this is working now, but this is one of, one of the key assumptions of, of our system. Now, as you can see, here's another example. This is actually a page from a marketplace. You can see everything that's, that's running, just like you can look into Etherscan and you can see that a transaction is pending. You can know the, the history of every contract. In our system, you can know that to an even, even deeper level about data delivery and off-chain computation. Now, what, what that results in is, is more and more data. Like here, you can see an example where there's two um, different uh, resources verifying identity. There's one resource proving that there's a trusted execution environment running for this node. There's a number of runs that they've done for specific uh, data delivery and computations. And there's a multitude of different environments that you could tell them to run in. So this level of clarity um, is, is meant to provide users with an ability to choose where they want to compromise on security. Do they want a 15 Oracle, Oracle network all running in AWS? Maybe they want five in AWS, five in Azure, five in GCP. Maybe they only need seven of them using SGX. And maybe they want civil resistance for maybe eight or nine of them. And maybe that's the right configuration of uh, security guarantees and decentralization to optimize cost versus security. But all of that is once again built on the fact that all of this data is generated and, and, it, and is reliable. Now, this is, uh, this is an example of, of something we recently released just this past week uh, with, with Binance, where we're actually looking um, at ways where it's very good when you have node operators that can generate data inputs and they can provide more and more security guarantees. But the, the, the next step is really giving people the ability to not only ingest data, but to affect other systems. So the initial implementation we have with Binance is about how do we how do we ingest data from Binance to trigger contracts? Subsequent implementations are going to be focused on how do you actually allow smart contracts to execute trades on, on these systems where price discovery happens. Now, the nuanced point there is uh, that's a very important thing, right? You're basically talking about here's, a, here's, a, here's an environment that's triggering the contract, generating an on-chain state change to, co 
to make something called, usually called the golden record, golden source of truth between parties. And then you're also having a system that's gonna settle or execute a trade in an environment where price discovery happens or where you, you want guarantees that you're, well, basically gonna get the best price, which in most cases are right now Binance, right? So the, I think the evolution is uh, how do we make a system that can generate data delivery to get us into a space that's about events-driven contracts? How do we capture all of the data about that data delivery in a way that provides guarantees about node operators so we can intelligently compose them into reliable and increasingly reliable networks of node operators? And then how do we take um, the reliable node operators that we've composed and how do we make them do even more useful things? Right? And, and this, isn't, this isn't a matter of doing the things that can be done on chain. This is a matter, like, we don't, we don't have a chain. The, the matter for us, the, the, the point is, how do you augment high quality blockchains that have great scalability or privacy capabilities or whatever they have with all the capabilities that they don't have for, for whatever reason or the capabilities they might have later? And I think that once you have high quality blockchains that provide various key properties like you know, scalability for gaming and you have an additional layer that generates all the necessary additional data delivery and off-chain computation that's needed to really build uh, a highly useful uh, application. Like for example, this, this, um, this example would be triggered by highly reliable data sources. You would have a state change on chain so people that know the contract is secure, but you could settle it in an environment that has price discovery. You, you, could, you, could, you, could, you could get the best price for, for the trade that you want to execute. Um, and, and, and that's really the flexibility we should be able to give people. If somebody wants to build something that gets the best price, they should be able to go and get the best price for their smart contract wherever, wherever it is. That's how I think people are going to compose the most useful applications. Now, this, this expansion into off-chain computation, uh, I think, depends on having provably high-quality node operators and also increasing the, the capabilities of what, a, of what um, a, an oracle can do. Uh, that, that's a lot of what we've been involved in recently. We've been expanding what a chain link can do by integrating with various high-quality environments. This is an architecture, basic, very basic architectural diagram from our post with Google, where we describe how a chain link can bridge the gap from an Ethereum uh, smart contract to all of Google's capabilities, in this case, BigQuery. And this is a slightly more advanced architecture where somebody actually built this and launched an application for DevCon where they were able to incentivize the generation of map data and they were able to pay out users based on a Google Cloud function and a BigQuery table proving that something happened. So uh, on the one hand, you could consider uh, chain links as an environment to do computation, but on the other hand, the more immediate value is to look at how do we bridge all the computational resources that aren't on chain into on chain environments while preserving security. And so there's, there's a huge world of, of computation and data, and there's a, a fascinating world of highly reliable contracts. And I think combining those two worlds is what's gonna, is what's gonna take everything in our space to the next level. So this is, this is an example of a, of, a, of a working application we're seeing more and more people build in this design pattern of using things like Google Cloud Functions together with a chain link that proves that those cloud functions were executed securely. This is another architecture that we recently released using Intel's trusted computing framework where if you want a trusted execution environment based computation and you want it connected to a smart contract on Ethereum, you can do that. You can define the relationship between your contract and this other set, other, other set of computations, and, and that interaction can be uh, proven to, to a much, uh, much higher degree than if you, if you did it yourself in some centralized way. Now, this brings me to the, uh, an, another, another part of, of, of what highly reliable computational environments in the form of an oracle can do, and they can generate privacy. So we have a paper called Mixicals. Um, that paper describes how you can have an off-chain computational environment generate um, basically orchestration between different smart contracts that are unrelated on chain, but that effectively serve the, the same purpose while creating privacy. So this means you can have a DeFi product that's triggered by high quality data, um, its outcomes remain private, and its payees remain private. And, and this, um, this is fundamentally a very big step in, in how you can attach an off-chain system 
to create privacy in an environment like Ethereum where you have a huge amount of private keys, a huge amount of money to be, uh, to be put into DeFi products, but privacy is a huge, um, huge barrier, right? So if you're interested in, in how Mixicals work, I'm glad to chat about it. You're, you're welcome to look at it on, online, but it's, it's actually a very simple system where you, you, you put the data that you want to be private in high re highly reliable node operators, you have them run it in something like a trusted execution environment, which means it protects them from viewing even by them, and you attain a certain level of privacy while, me, while also having a high quality on-chain contract that's accessible to a large, large audience of purchasers. Now, what, what all this generates in the long term is the, the usage of all these chain links in, in various environments and in all their connections to all these different environments makes something called a web of trust model where the trust isn't generated by people um, electively signing, but it's generated by usage. So you can soon enough see there's five DeFi contracts, there's three insur de decentralized insurance contracts, there's five uh, gaming contracts, all using this oracle. And so what, what happens over the long term is that not only do you have data in a very specific way about each uh, individual chain link's relationship with individual applications, but the cumulative uh, relationship between all of the users provides a web of trust. And this in the long term solidifies the position of an oracle as, as being highly reliable. So, yeah, so I, I, I don't think I have enough time to go into a lot of our subsequent plans, but we, um, you know, we're working on this body of work. We're seeking to expand even more uh, the security guarantees that are provided by oracles and the, the, all, all the data that's available as well as all the computational capabilities that people could use through such a system. And uh, you know, we're excited to work for you, uh, work you know, basically for you and with you as, uh, as academic researchers and, um, and security uh, auditors. And uh, so if you're here at this conference, you're, you're interested in this problem, we're, uh, we're a very security focused group. We're thrilled to hear your feedback, even if you don't, in fact, if you, if you don't like the system, please, uh, please come to me. I really wanna hear about it. I'm, uh, I'm very interested in a dialogue. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so if, you, if, you, if you'd like to join us, it's careers at chain.link, and we have uh, support at smartcontract.com. Um, we're very easy to reach. Pretty much almost all the emails go to me anyway. I like, have too many emails now, but um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>